<laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Appreciate you coming out tonight for uh, the town council meeting. If we can please call the roll. Mayor Breakers? Here. Vice Mayor Albritton? Present. Councilmember Hartman? Here. Councilmember Jablonski? Here. Councilmember Kaczynski? Here. We have a quorum, Mayor. Excellent. Thank you. If you'll please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> all right. Uh, once again, really appreciate everybody coming out this evening. Um, with the uh, indulgence of the council, I'd like to do a couple of quick introductions first uh, outside the normal flow of our meetings. First of all, I'd like to invite uh, Sikhs to come on up and talk about the 5K and um, the program that's going on here coming up on April 1st. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. We are less than 30 days away from our fifth annual, uni annual Unity and Diversity 5K Run Slash Walk. We have 300 runners and nearly 200 volunteers and expect numbers to grow as we get closer. Please reach out to friends and family to sign up and support our event. On a separate note, we are holding a fundraiser on March 15th at Texas Roadhouse in Miramar. Please go out with your friends and family to help raise money for our event. Make sure to mention SYA at checkout to donate to the cause. Once again, we are exactly 23 days away from race day and are super excited. There will be games, food, and music for you to enjoy with your friends. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Naoki Takahashi. I'm here on behalf of Mission Vida, which is you know working alongside them. Great. Um, Thank you. I've been there for about eight years now since I've started, like since I was in high school, and recently, my with the help of my fiance, which you met, I believe last week. Um, we've been trying to do more outreach, and so this is one of the first events that we'll be doing with them. Um, and so we'll be working alongside the Sikh Youth Association and Heartway Church, and just want to share a little bit about you know the church. Perfect. And, Thank you. You know what this means to us. So Misa and Vida is a Spanish-speaking church consisting of people from many different like Latin American countries, usually like Venezuela, Colombia is like our biggest kind of like majority there, um, and. They were all just brought together, you know, in this community where there isn't that many Spanish speakers. Um, so even though I don't speak the language very well, <laughs> I don't speak Spanish natively. Uh, they definitely, you know, opened their arms and, and accepted me as part of their family. And there's so much love there, and I appreciate all everything they've done for me there. Um, and one of the like like Misa Vida's uh, motto is "Restaurados para restaurar," which means they aim to be restored in order to restore others. That means, you know, not just people inside the church, but outside the church as well. Um, with this in mind, like Misa Vida, you know, believe that Jesus would walk hand, hand in hand with people of all different colors, different backgrounds, all that stuff, all different beliefs, which is why we believe that having this, you know, being a part of this 5K, you know, um, it's just another way to like reach out, support our community in, in a new way, you know, that they've been doing the past couple of years. Um, and just work towards this top common goal of you know, celebrating uh, different ethnicities, different communities, you know, and separate and you know, celebrating the differences between all of us. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you. Appreciate uh, the collaboration there, and and it does say a lot for our community and and a, a great example for our world, frankly. So thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, the second guest we've got here, I don't think Mary was planning on coming up and saying anything, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. Mary Molina McPhee, she's a commissioner in the uh, town of Weston, and um, she's a great friend to the town of Southwest Ranches. Mary, it's fantastic to have you here this evening. Thank you for coming by. Thank you. All right, now let's uh, jump into our normal uh, agenda. And our first presentation, uh, Andy, you want to give an introduction here? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, tonight's presentation actually came at request of Councilmember Hartman, a uh, conversation that he and I had last fall or into the winter. They thought it would be good to get uh, the code process, how things work, and in, in front of the council and in front of the public. 
just to increase transparency, to increase people's knowledge with how that works. So, uh, you know, in light of recent events, uh, some other things, I, I've kind of been thinking about this, and it goes, I think, about the uh, rural workshop that we did in January, and we learned that people have different versions on what's rural, and we learned that people have very different versions on what code enforcement should be. So, uh, you know, Julio's got a presentation that he's gonna, he's gonna do for you tonight. Uh, I can tell you that, that code enforcement may be the most difficult function that, that we do in town. Uh, you, you make nobody happy in the process. It, it's very difficult, but uh, Julio and his staff do well with it. And uh, I just wanna turn it over to him to, to give that presentation. Thank you. Perfect, good. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, all of Council. This evening, um, as Andy mentioned, I think it would be a good idea to explain the entire code process. So for that reason, I've prepared this presentation. First off, I'd like to uh, explain what the objectives are for our department. Uh, it's essentially, the function of code enforcement is to secure the health, safety, welfare of the residents by enforcing the town's code. This helps to maintain property values, and in the way we do that is always uh, by seeking voluntary compliance. You know, there's this uh, misconcep misconception that the goal of code enforcement is to be punitive, to be revenue generating for the town, and that's completely false. Code enforcement primary goal is always to seek voluntary compliance. Now, there are cases where uh, people don't comply, and as a last resort, we do impose penalties in order to, you know, try and uh, gain compliance by having a punitive measure in place. Now, our department consists of myself as the code enforcement director, my assistant code enforcement director, Manfred Vallette, our code enforcement officer, Concepcion Campos, and last but not least, our administrative coordinator, Janaina Anderson, or as she is commonly known to most people in town, Jenna. As the code enforcement director, I've got a little over 10 years in code enforcement experience with the town, actually. Uh, prior to that, I actually uh, enforced um, the law. I served eight years in, code, in Coast Guard uh, I was a maritime law enforcement officer, so I did that for eight years, transitioned into code enforcement, and in doing so, I've obtained levels one through four in code enforcement by the Florida Association of Code Enforcement. That includes level one, the fundamental, fundamentals of code enforcement, level two, administrative aspects, level three, legal issues, and level four, which is officer, officer safety. My assistant code enforcement director, Manfred Vallette, has about five years in code enforcement. Part of that has been served here with the town and the other part with the city of Sunrise. He is certified in levels one, two, and three. That again is level one, the fundamentals of code enforcement, administrative aspects, and legal issues. Our code officer, which has been with the town for two years at did have a bit of engineering experience prior to coming into the town. She is certified in levels one and four, that is fundamentals of code enforcement and officer safety. As an added bonus, she actually obtained a, uh, she became a certified animal control officer by um, attending a program that was offered by Davey. It was by the American Animal Cruelty Investigation School. She attended that, uh, that class and eventually became certified as an animal control officer, which is a huge benefit to the town. And again, last but not least, Jenna Anderson. She's been with the town as an administrative coordinator for just about three years. And she, most of you may know her as the, as the fire chief or assistant fire chief, which uh, she serves at, in the Southwest Ranches Volunteer Fire Department for just about seven years. Now, if anyone needs to submit a complaint after hours or during the weekend when you may or may not be able to reach someone in code enforcement, even we do have coverage at nights and weekends, there are times where we only have one officer during the weekend, so if they're not in the office, 
you can always call the code enforcement hotline. That number is 954-343-7449. As long as you can leave your name, callback number, your address, the location of possible code violations, and the description of the possible code violation, we should be able to address that issue just by you leaving that uh, voicemail. But if you'd prefer to speak to an officer yourself, you can just leave a name and callback number. We'll make sure we get back to you. You know, usually we get back to everyone within 24 hours. So if you need to speak to a live person, just leave your name and a callback number. We'll make sure we, we get back to you. Now, what gives code enforcement the authority to enforce laws? We were given the authority primarily through the Florida statute, Chapter 162, that is known as the Local Government, Government Code Enforcement Board Act. This act provides the guidelines and requirements on how to enforce the codes, how to impose penalties, provides the authority to a code enforcement board or special magistrate, it sets the fine limitations, and it sets the rules for appeals. And of course, the town, our code enforcement department, enforces the codes established by the town by the Unified Land Development Code. This is what council has determined, you know, would favor the residents. It's what they primarily, um, what has been established as to how the, the council wants the town to, to be by establishing standards for the town, whether that be maintenance standards or codes on how things should be built, etc. Now, I also wanted to include something that may, many people may not have been aware of, which is Senate Bill 60 that was passed, I believe, Ju July 1st in 2021. What this bill did is essentially prohibit anonymous complaints to be filed for code enforcement. Previously, you could essentially call in, not have to give your name or any information, just file a complaint and code enforcement would investigate. Well, as of July, I said July 1st, 2021, that bill was passed, which essentially prohibits uh, an anonymous complaints. So in order for you to file a complaint, you'll have to provide your name address, and then of course the complaint. Now there are there is an exception to this, which is unless an alleged violation presents an imminent threat to public health, safety, or welfare, or imminent destruction of habitat or sensitive resources. And there is also currently something being proposed to where this bill may be overturned to go back to how it used to be and essentially allow, allow anonymous complaints but as of now, Senate Bill 60 is in place. Therefore, anonymous complaints at the moment are not allowed. Now I'd like to discuss the difference of proactive versus reactive. Now the town of Southwest Ranches is primarily reactive, not proactive. What that means is in, in order for our code enforcement department to initiate a case or, or initiate an investigation, it has to be due to a complaint from the public. Now complaints, as I mentioned, can be filed through a phone call to any one of our staff or by calling the code enforcement hotline as long as you provide the information I previously mentioned. Or you can even provide it in the form of a letter or email, again, as long as your information is provided. Now as I mentioned, we are prim primarily reactive, but there are a few items which are proactive that's been established by town council. One of those is bulk trash, overgrown plots, any violations of the dark skies ordinance, unmaintained roadways on private roads, and our favorite filling and grading, illegal filling and grading. So I'd like to explain what each of these consists of. So the vi violations that uh, pertain to bulk trash are piles that are placed out on incorrect dates, piles that are exceeding the size limit, which is 12 cubic yards, and items not allowed for pickup, such as hazardous or construction materials. Now, I provided some examples of each to reference. You can see this first picture, a little hard to see, a little hard to distinguish between the pile and the actual hedges, but there is a pile that I mean, it's, I would say, well over 100 cubic yards. So this pile was placed out 
with the expectancy that it would be picked up by our service provider. Obviously, this pile exceeds the limit. It was not picked up, turned into a code violation, and ultimately had to be, they had to make arrangements, arrangements with the service provider to have this removed. Sorry, let me just go back a bit. This second picture shows an example of, you know, power that was put out that seems to be typical within the town. However, the issue here is the size. And while they did make an attempt to cut things into manageable pieces, the trunk of this tree here that was put out for pickup exceeds the capabilities of the grapple truck. So that pile right there would not be serviceable by the service provider. So that would, this resulted in a code notice, you know, violation, and essentially they had to either dispose of this item themselves or cut it into smaller pieces that were manageable for the service provider. So this pile, while it seems innocently enough, it's actually uh, railroad ties that are, you know, actually not allowed for bulk pickup due to the fact that they're soaked in a hazardous uh, material called uh, creosote. So that alone would make this uh, make this pile unserviceable. So they would actually have to arrange for um, uh, either a service provider to charge a fee for a special pickup because this cannot go to the regular dump site. This hazardous material has to be disposed of in a different manner. So this pile actually resulted in a code violation. Next item are overgrown plots. Overgrown plots, well, seems simple enough, is essentially any grass, weed, or other low grain plant that exceeds the limits established by the town. Now, there are more stringent requirements for commercial property. That is, any grass over six inches would be non-compliance, and for residential property, that would be 18 inches. So this first slide will show a clear example of the distinction between a freshly cut lawn versus an overgrown lot. As you can see, there's a clear distinction and easy to see that this property here is exceeding the 18-inch limit, which resulted in this property being cited. Next example is just a vacant lot that has been abandoned for a while, not being properly maintained. Eventually this property was cited and I actually got to see the results of this. It became completely different property after the property owner was cited. And uh, you know, I know Andy said that everyone hates us, but let me give you, this was one example of a property owner that was actually very thankful we ended up citing him. He was appreciative of the, you know, the end result of how his property looked after it was cleaned up. This is another property that was cited within the town. And this slide was chosen to show that not only do we look for uh, the inside of a property being maintained, we also ensure that the swales adjacent to the property are being maintained. So as you can see, this property here was not cut for quite some time and the swale area became severely overgrown. Next issue I'd like to talk about is the dark skies ordinance. So dark skies, the dark sky ordinance essentially uh, prohibits any lighting that would be essentially um, intrusive to any other neighbor. So any lighting that produces glare any lighting that exceeds uh, our threshold of 0.10 foot candles, any up lighting that exceeds 1800 lumens, or any athletic lighting would result in a violation of the dark skies ordinance. So one example that you'll see here, which I'm sure the vice mayor is very uh, familiar with, <laughs> is a property that had two very bright, I believe even three very bright spotlights. You know, they were on all night throughout the entire night and uh, obviously as you can see from the picture clearly producing glare and as you can see from this following picture 
this is the result of the, the lights shining onto someone's property. So because we want to preserve our dark skies, this was obviously a violation. You know, it's uh, actually quite a bit of a nuisance to have to deal with that lighting, you know, in the middle of the night. <clears throat> Another issue are unmaintained roadways on private roads. So it seems that some people are not aware this is a proactive issue, but essentially the reason why this came about is on any public road, the town has the ability to just go in and fix them. We patch roads all the time on public roads. However, on private roads, we don't have that ability. We don't have the right to just go in and fix a private road. Therefore, council, uh, quite recently uh, decided to make this a proactive item where they must repair the asphalt of, on a private road and it must be up to the town standards. So the reason why that's important is this example right here. As you can see, some of these holes were actually patched up, but they were not patched properly. This is not asphalt. These were actually filled in by concrete. It's not going to last very long. It's not going to hold up anywhere near the expected uh, life of the road. Just another example, you can see how how big and deep these uh, holes can get. So this can actually be a life safety issue. Uh, you don't want, you know, it's something as simple as driving a car, you don't want to fall into this and cause you to swerve a bit, possibly, engage, you know, cause an accident. Riding a horse, this can cause you know injury to horses or even kids riding their bikes down the road might fall into this, fall over, and get injured. As you can see, there's another example of a of a hole. There's this entire hole here was actually repaired at the same time, and because it was not repaired pro uh, properly, just failed shortly after. And Filling and grading, which is definitely the biggest uh, issue here in the town. It is our priority here to enforce this. So any illegal filling or grading, that means that any changes in elevations without prior approval or permitting. So any kind of uh, fill permit is going to require a wetland determination, whether that be a level one, two, or three. So depending on the level of fill permit, it may require the drainage district approval in some cases, a topographic survey may be required. And in very severe cases where uh, the limits have been exceeded and you cannot meet the drainage district standards, removal of the fill material is required. So for example, if a property is determined by South Broward has to have a 20% water retention area and they've, they've filled beyond what's allowed and they have only 10% of the area or the property as, as a water retention area. There's no other way around it. There's no variance that can be provided, no exception. That fill material has to be removed in order for that permit to be approved. So you can see here in this picture, there's a little over 10 loads of fill material brought in. This property brought in this material without any permits. Luckily, it was not spread, so we were able to see the pre elevations prior to the material being brought in and, and spread. So this resulted in a violation. It's a clear example of a, what would be a violation by bringing in fill without any permits. This example here is a developer who wanted to start preparing the property without the permits. They were obviously stopped. We issued a stop work order and they had to come in and get after the fact permits for the fill material that was brought into the property. And this third example serves to answer a question that we is uh, very common for our, for our department. How much material requires a permit? Quite simple, one load of fill requires a permit. If you're bringing in bags of sand that you can buy at Home Depot and you're just bringing it in in your pickup truck and you buy 10 bags, no permits required. But when you have a dump truck coming in and bringing in a 
low to fill material, which is typically about 18 cubic yards, that will require a level one fill permit. So next I'd like to discuss the process. You know, we've already discussed how to submit a complaint, but what happens to that complaint once it's been submitted to our department? Well, first we have to investigate the alleged violation. You know, once we receive a complaint, we'll go out to the property, inspect it, and determine if there is a valid, uh, an actual violation found. The officer will document the violation and subsequently issue a notice of violation. The notice of violation, all notices have to be mailed, certified mail with return receipt. A copy of that notice is also posted at the property and posted in our town hall. Now we generally provide 10 business days for a violation to be brought into compliance. However, we do always provide extensions upon request. So it, essentially the notice serves to initiate the communication with the resident. So if they, but they, if they call us and tell us they're looking to comply but just need a bit more time than what we've been provided, we will generally always allow an, an, an extension because again, as I mentioned, our primary goal is voluntary compliance, not to be punitive. But if the violation is not corrected by the deadline provided, then we will issue a notice of hearing and the, set is case, it, the case is set for a special magistrate hearing. Once the case is presented to the special magistrate, we must prove the case and essentially a final order will be provided by the magistrate which provides a final compliance date still without any fines being imposed. A final compliance date will be set and the and a fine amount will be established which can range anywhere from $100 to $250 a day for the time the violation exists. For any repeat violation, we have the ability to double that amount. So for example, we set a fine for $250 a day. They come into compliance, but three months down the line, the same violation occurs. We can bring it forth again but the violation can be doubled, so that would be $500 per day for that violation. Now, in the instances where an event is irreparable or irreversible, we may actually impose a maximum penalty of up to $5,000 for the incident. Now, even when a final order is provided, again, because we try to help everyone come into compliance and provide them adequate time to correct the violation, if the, if the violator comes into town and can provide a justified reason why they have not been able to bring it into compliance but are working on it, the magistrate can actually amend the final order to provide additional time to be brought into compliance. <clears throat> and if the violation is not corrected, fines are imposed on the property until the violation is corrected and eventually a lien is placed on the property until the fines are paid. Well, yeah, before you move on, sure. if you wouldn't mind going back, there's, can you explain what irreparable or irreversible violations are? I don't understand. Sure. So that would be a violation that occurs and you're unable to fix. For example, a party that occurred. A party that occurred, once it's done, it's done. You, you can't fix it. It's already happened. So that would be a violation that's considered irreversible or irreparable. Thank you. So the next thing I want to talk about are essentially hot topics in the town. Um, essentially, we've been dealt with, recently been dealt with a lot of unperm unpermitted parties, which in turn resort, res you know, resort to noise complaints, and a lot of these have been brought forth by short-term rentals. So unpermitted parties, essentially any assembly should be limited to family, friends, and acquaintances of the property owners and or permanent residents of the, prem permanent residents of the premises and their guests. So anytime you have a gathering which consists of 30 or more people, you should obtain a permit to have that gathering. 
Uh, Julio, can you, uh, we just had an incident I know you're aware of uh, a month or so ago where we, resident had a couple different letters on that. Can you kind of, while we're on the topic, just speak about how that letter can be transformed over time? Sure. So essentially, we do have, for the most part, a standard letter. However, that letter can vary based on uh, the specifics of the event. For example, um, we document how many people are attending the event, the proposed times of the event, um, what the event is for, how they propose parking for the event. So based on the information they provide, it can actually uh, change you know, the letter, even though it is, for the most part, standard. There are certain things, for example, if you have temporary structures, if you, if you build a, uh, you know, a stand for, uh, you have someone performing, a live band or something like that, that, that can impact how that letter is, is presented as an approval. But for the most part, the letter is a standard letter and is issued for any, any applicant. For the most part, it's gonna be the same, which is small variances. So, in no event shall any assembly be held for profit. There should be no admission fee, payment, or other consideration aside from normal congratulatory gifts. And in no event shall any assembly be advertised or open to the general public. As I mentioned before, it's supposed to be for friends and family. So, as an assembly cannot take place upon vacant lot or undeveloped property or on and or on an unoccupied dwelling, so it must be a habited structure, a primo, a, you know, dwelling with someone living on it. Can't just be a. We've had this incident where we've had a property, you know, it had a house on it. No one lived there, but they used it to host events. It had a essentially a. It was. It was not listed as a short-term rental, but essentially they were renting it out just for events. We had um, maybe about once a month, they would host an event where they'd have, you know, sometimes an excess of 100 people showing up to this property, and it was just being used to host events, no one living on the property. Four feet? Four feet? Four feet, yes. Now, noise. Noise means any sound which annoys or disturbs human or animals or which causes or tends to cause any adverse psychological or physiological effect on humans or animals. So no person shall operate or cause to be operated any sound in such a manner as to create a noise disturbance that is aud audible in a receiving land. So this is direct from our code and this is how we determine whether the, there is a noise violation or noise nuisance. So as I, I, as I mentioned before, short-term short rentals cannot obtain permits to host an event. So we have had instances where we, I'd be approached by someone who owns a property, is renting it out, doing short-term rentals, and wants to host an event. They get denied if they apply because our code states that, again, it has to be for someone living on the property for their friends and family. And it can't be for profit. And obviously, if you're doing a short-term rental, that's for profit. So the way we limit the um, the adverse, you know, effect to the neighborhood is we only allow six permits to be issued per property per calendar year. So while we do allow people to have parties, they are limited by the time frame and also the amounts of um, events that can be hold, held within a year. So six is the limit, and our limit that we allow a party to be permitted for is 11 p.m. So I, I do make everyone aware of that when they apply, and I also let them know this doesn't necessarily mean you have to disperse and shut down the party, but no noise should be audible after 11 p.m. That's the cutoff time, so any noise that continues past 11 p.m., even if they've attained a permit, could result in a violation if we receive complaints. That's all I have for this evening, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. May. <laughs> wow, it's promoted. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone has any questions, concerns, anything.
I have, I have a question for you, sure. Julio, and that deals with the par parties and with noise. You mentioned at 11 p.m. If they generate no noise, they, they can run their party till 4 a.m. Technically, that correct? is correct. Yes, okay. if it's not causing a disturbance, right. they should have no issues. Again, okay. uh, they would only cause a disturbance if police are called. Right. Now, if if uh, using a same a similar scenario um, with our noise ordinance, if if they are, they've got a rock and roll band that's you can hear five blocks away. Um, that's not per the permit doesn't allow that to happen. In other words, our noise ordinance kicks in. As soon as the noise leaves leaves the property 24/7, correct? Correct to an extent. So, police if police is called because the noise is too loud, police will would um, approach the homeowner and ask if it's too loud. Ask that they turn it down. However, if the noise is brought down to a reasonable level, then um, the permit does allow them to continue having that event, but. If it's brought up to a, a level that the police officer or code officer determines that it's too loud, then no, that permit would not protect them from that. Okay. So we do always give them one opportunity to bring the noise down. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can I jump in on that question for a second, Gary? Yeah. Go ahead. So I just want to be clear. That was a that was a great question. So is there any difference between how loud the sound can be if you have a permit or if you don't have a permit is it the same criteria or is it different it's different in the sense that if you don't have a permit then any noise would be considered a violation if it's if it's audible by your neighbor whether it's reasonable it would still be a violation based on the fact that no permit was obtained okay okay Huli, i'd just like to say that the lighting that you showed was handled very well by your code officers and the resident once it was brought to his attention and through the guidance of your uh, code enforcement officer out there uh, the owner himself actually came to the uh, site where those pictures were taken and directed the people to correct those lights so I, I thank you for that and uh, like I said that everything worked well with them thank you vice mayor I got one sure Anyone? just one Thank you for your work with um, loud parties. You know, a lot of parties that have been happening in the area. And um, also your enforcement of the Dark Skies Ordinance. It's something that uh, when I was elected that uh, we first uh, broadened the scope of code violations to be a primary offense. Thank you so much for doing your work on that. Thank you, Council Member, but I uh, couldn't do it alone. I have my team that helps me. Uh, I have my officers who actually work the nights. They're the ones primarily dealing with these these issues. They do a great job and couldn't do it without them. Just a quick comment, Julio. Sure. Thank you for putting this together. Um, I've been sitting in council meetings for over 20 years, and every time an issue pops up, I'm learning something new, like tonight, what we were uh, talking about. I think one of the biggest challenges we have in the town is really resident education. Um, Repeat offenders are going to do what they're going to do, but I think most of the people in our town that are violators probably don't even know. And I know we've talked in the past about outreach, and I'm glad to see in this, I, I just got today's, uh, the, this month, this upcoming month's um, uh, newsletter, and it's got an article in here about uh, uh, fill and excavation permits. and. You know, I know everybody doesn't read this, and we probably need to get this out through some of the other channels as well. But this goes a long way to put in front of people that you can't just order up 50 truckloads of fill and, a, a, you know, a bulldozer on Monday, and you can do whatever you want. Because what people don't realize is their activities generally impact somebody else. When it comes to fill, they flood their neighbors. When it comes to loud parties, upset the family. I mean, there's a lot of young families here with little babies. And, you know, if there's a rock and roll party going on next door or whatever kind of music it is until 3 o'clock in the morning, nobody in that house sleeps next door. So these are all, they're not here to stop the fun. They're really here to maintain a certain quality of life. And I, I know you guys probably have the toughest job in town hall. And I applaud you for, for being professional and applying it where necessary and most importantly 
it's important to realize, everybody, that their job is not punitive. Their job isn't to come and make your life miserable. Their, their job is to come and get you into compliance. And I've worked with Julio. Uh, somebody's called on me. Um, and, you know, as long as you're working with them, they are uh, reasonable and, and they're very happy to work with you. But if you go to the code enforcement meetings and you hear all the people that show up saying, you know, I shouldn't be cited for this or charged with this or et cetera, et cetera, they're doing it in the basis of law. They're not doing it because they've got a grudge or your next door neighbor called and said, I don't like my next door neighbor, charge them with this. There's evidence, there's a whole hearing process. This goes through due process no different than if you go to court. So I want to congratulate you on the professionalism of your team and the hard work you guys do day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councilman. And on that topic of community outreach, uh, was saving this for a later time, but uh, we've actually, I've actually discussed this with uh, Andy in communications with December. She's helped me out. Um, so basically, we want to propose a uh, program where we're going to be setting up stand a little tent over at the farmer's market on Saturdays just to have one of our staff members there to be able to set up shop and just be able to answer any questions. Maybe people who don't want to come into town hall to report something may want to stop by the farmer's market, talk to us and you know we can provide just information, provide you know provide education and just explain for anyone that missed this process, we can definitely provide further education at these uh, f you know farmers market as a way to you know program for community outreach Excellent. so my assistant co-director Manfred Bellet he's the one who's actually volunteered to be out there and I think he can do a great job at explaining everything I just did and you know providing that knowledge to the residents great thank you yeah I think that's a great idea um, let me just everybody has set it up here uh, extremely well but uh, thank you to you your staff um, I do believe it's the toughest job in town um, and uh, you all handle it very professionally and I appreciate what you're saying and it's true that you're just looking for compliance we're not looking to this to be punitive so appreciate that um, I do think the idea of, of further education is critical um, as I was thinking about this um, knowing this was coming up one of the things that I wondered about was if there is, and we don't, I'm not looking really for feedback on this, but maybe we can think about it and talk about it in the future. If there is a way, rather than doing a code complaint per se, if there could be some way of just uh, kind of uh, with no, nothing written up or nothing, not even a warning, but just uh, set up a, uh, a, a meeting with resident to kind of go through their property to say, hey, what's in compliance, what's not in compliance, and do it in a, a more of an informative way, no, no follow-up there, but just from a communication standpoint so that people that maybe are concerned about something can get some feedback without knowing that there's not going to be any further repercussions for it. Um, just an idea. Um, anyway, we can talk about that in the future. Yes, but um, but great presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it have, to I, you and the entire staff. I have, I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, and by the way, that's a pretty good idea. A a non-official inspection of a right. property, yeah. you know, and then just to get an opinion and let it, it go with it that. It can't be done legally. Okay, well that just got shot down. What that? <laughs> it can't be done legally. Why not? There's a Supreme Court decision on doctrine of latches. Uh, that says that if a code officer, and David's shaking his head because I'm sure Councilmember Kaczynski knows it, if a code enforcement officer goes to a property and sees an open violation that he knows is a violation, if he does not report it or he or she reports it, um, the municipality is waived forever for citing that person for that violation. But we do that all the time for the things that are, uh, are reactive. Our, our, our code folks see that all the time and don't report it. If he sees something when inspecting a property on a proactive basis, or even if he's asked to uh, inspect the property, he is required to report it. That's what the law says. All right. I mean, if the law is the law, but it's 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 a crappy law because. 
there, there's, I'll say that because there's, there's because at the end of the day, the idea, as what he just said, is that it's compliance, and and if that takes a significant tool away from compliance, um, so, that's 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 not yeah, good. So I'm just letting you. I understand. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, the, the, the didn't write it. Thing just only because you all brought it up, so I might as well say it. I was in Tallahassee all day um, and uh, on various issues. There is no current bill running, and that's why Councilmember Hartman, uh, Vice Mayor, couldn't, no, Councilmember, sorry, couldn't find it um, to remove the anonymous complaint. You know, we were told that it was going forward, but there's no active bill. Like, you know, I sat in Robin Bartleman's office with her aide looking. There is no bill, you know, that's currently being moving, removing it. Um, Hollywood was in uh, Tallahassee also, so were many other cities. It was Palm Beach Days today as well. What most cities are doing, and I brought this up to Andy, and he's like, ugh, you know, I don't know. But m all cities are having the problem now with uh, anonymous complaints. It's pitting neighbor against neighbor. It's causing major issues of violence throughout cities when they find out who cited them or who called them in for a violation. What many cities are doing, and it's, I'm not saying you should do it, but I just want to throw it out so you know, and Andy's laughing, is that when a code violation comes in for a certain district in that it, it goes to the district representative someone calls you know a council member and says hey my neighbor has their rv you know i can see it every day it's driving me crazy they log in that code uh, the uh, complaint as the district commissioner to avoid the issue with the residents uh, attacking each other yeah. So I, I just want to let you know what other municipalities are doing yeah. because I it mean, is we're, causing issues. Yeah, that's not a good idea. We're here to represent the residents. We're not here to be reporters of violations. So I think that's that's not a viable. I mean, I, I get other folks are doing it. Not a good idea. Yeah, not a good idea. Just comment on that as well because Keith, um, yeah. uh, after I had heard about the, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was going to swing in the other direction again. Um, you know, people call me regularly. And I was advised not to file under my name because then it, it can be construed as harassment. You, know, you don't think so? Okay. Well, yeah. and I got bad advice from a cheap yeah. lawyer. No, no. <laughs> uh, you, you, it would be harassment. It's harassment to constantly call on the same property. We have pr property owners that do that. That becomes harassment. But not you calling in, you know, various code enforcement complaints on separate property. Owners. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good enough. Thank you. Okay, getting back to the question I was going to ask. <laughs> uh, it's, it's hypothetical. Um, you were mentioning Phil. Um, a neighbor asked me if they could bring in Phil to make a raised garden, vegetable garden, small plot, and I advised them to get a level one permit. Now, it probably involved one or two pickup truck loads of uh, topsoil and sand or mulch, organic mixture. Um, I heard you say earlier that they may not re be required to get a permit on, on something like that. Can you clear that up for me? Sure. Me? Essentially, if you're able to go on your own and just buy a few bags of material from Lowe's, Home Depot, and you bring it home on your, on your truck or you know, van or however you can get it to your house, if it's enough to where you can do it yourself and you're buying bags of it, you'd have to buy you know several hundred bags to equate to a a thumb truck load so essentially if, if it's enough to where you can do it yourself you buy it at a uh, can you buy a bulk like a bushel stop or something like that or like a pickup truck load it's not in bags once you're getting to a pickup truck load i mean if it gets to a gray area i always you know resort to um you know, I confer with yeah, Rod. Is like, like he's a, the a, professional. So I pickup truck is like one cubic yard. Yeah, about a ton. It's not yeah, very much. Yeah, it's usually. Uh, no, I think it's. I think it's. Yeah, yeah, it's usually about one cubic yard. Yeah. Yeah, as opposed to a, a tr uh, you know, a yeah, eighteen yards in one of the big yeah. dump trucks. Yeah, I, I, the, the question which was posed to me about doing a raised garden bed, you know, for vegetables and. You know that kind of thing, and I should get get a permit <laughs> for that amount, especially if you're talking about organic material mulch, or you talk about uh, dirt soil, so dirt, uh, you know, uh, for plants cultivation. Again, for that amount, 
the, the purpose of a fill permit is to avoid any changes in elevation. So anything that's going to impact drainage. That amount, it's very unlikely that it's going to cause any kind of impact to drainage, especially if it's in a, you know, in a, for, for um, a garden where it's already kind of all closed yeah, like, off and established. Right, yeah, right. Like six inches the, wall, you know. That kind of. Right, so that, that's not going to impact drainage in any way. We, we're not going to be citing for that. I believe, you know, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Rod, but yeah, that's essentially something that we allow without the need to get a fill permit. All right. I just wanted to clear that up a little bit. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Awesome. Anything else? Great job, Julio. Thank you for uh, all the information. Thank you, Mayor and okay. Council. All right. Uh, proclamation for procurement, procurement month. You know, I'll, while we get that prepared I just want to say a couple words that uh, we are we are very fortunate to have a highly professional and well-trained procurement department um, and they they keep us out of trouble and they also find us uh, some exceptional you know purchases at a good price so um, we are very fortunate so it's great to have this proclamation this evening Whereas the public procurement profession plays a significant role in the efficiency and effectiveness of both government and business, and whereas in addition to the purchase of goods and services, procurement adds value to the organization by performing such functions as executing, implementing, and administering contracts, developing strategic procurement strategies, and cultivating working relationships with suppliers, other procurement professionals, and other departments within the organization. And whereas public procurement professionals in the town of Southwest Ranches and in other public and private organizations have tremendous influence on the economic conditions in the United States with the cumulative purchasing power running into the billions of dollars. And whereas procurement in the town of Southwest Ranches is committed to providing high caliber strategic, logistical, and operational support of all departments within the town of Southwest Ranches. And whereas procurement and the town of Southwest Ranches recognize support and practice the public procurement values and guiding principles of accountability, ethics, impartiality, professionalism, service and transparency established by the Institute for Public Procurement or NIGP as fundamental tenets of the pu public procurement profession. And whereas NIGP has proclaimed the month of March as procurement month to further expand the awareness of the purchasing professionals role to governmental officials, the general public, business, and corporate leaders. And whereas I urge all citizens to recognize the role of the purchasing and materials management profession within business, industry, and government. Now therefore be it resolved that the mayor and town council of the town of Southwest Ranches do hereby proclaim March 2023 as procurement month. Great. Thank you, Russell. And like I said, we do appreciate all the hard work that our procurement team does. Emil, please pass that along. We appreciate it. All right, number five, public comment. Do we have any public comment this evening? Yes, yes Mayor, we have uh, five public comment cards. Uh, the first is going to be uh, the Sikh Society. They left? Yep, they've already oh, they did. Yep. Oh, they signed in, sorry. Newell Hongsworth followed by Anna Coldis, followed by John Griotti, and final speaker will be Pamela Olson. Noel Hollingsworth, 199th Avenue, fasten your seat belts. 14 months ago, I came before this council to correct an egregious assault on 199th, 201, 202 by our engineering department on the perfectly functioning swales of our area and the physical damage to individuals on our town and injuries that, that these changes caused. That was in January of last year. September 12th, a resolution finally came forth to this council, putting changes to the engineering and Tisdor drainage section. 
The council saw that there was defects and forwarded it to the Drainage and Infrastructure Committee. Drainage and Infrastructure on 11-15-2002 reviewed it and made minor changes to what was submitted to them by myself. Very minor changes. The board then voted, which is shown in their approval in January of this year, of their minutes, referring it back in November to the council. The drainage staff liaison did not forward it. The council liaison to that committee did not forward it or check on it. None of the council that was present at that meeting asked where the heck it was. I asked the other day, where was it? Because I figured it would come in February before the council. It didn't. It is now March. This is an empty meeting, a perfect time for it to come before you. It's not here. No one knows where it is. We're working on it. Well, we're going to see. We've been busy. Every excuse in the world by staff, except here it is, because it's in a completed form that was approved. All I had to do is be plugged back into the format that was already there. We have waited for delays, it being ignored. I'd like a few, what, another 30 seconds. Yep. Waited, it's been ignored, delayed, and every other excuse in the world by staff. Drainage and Infrastructure Board took care of their end of the deal in one meeting. But it did not come before their October meeting because staff delayed it then. So it came before November when I pressed for it. It is now time for this council to say, next meeting, have it before you as a first resolution before anything else and take care of it. We have waited 14 months. That will be the 15th month. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Anna, you can come up as your call. John Grady is next, and then Pamela is fine. Good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? Uh, Julio, thanks for that report. It was really helpful. Um, I know that our little association will eat it up, but I'm not here um, um, on, on behalf of the association, just me personally. I just wanted to take a minute to kind of share some thoughts, which go something like as follows. I'm doing this contemporaneously. I thought I might have time to throw some notes together, but that didn't happen. And for me, when I first moved to the town, I, um, I definitely fit into the category of ignorance is bliss. And the more I get involved, the more... I, I see things that are just disturbing to me. So to just kind of share um, a, a thought that I, I just want to share with everyone in the room. First and foremost, we're neighbors. We, we live together. We're property owners. We care about each other. And, um, and I just hope we can get to a point where everything that Julio said that he does can can always always happen, and um, I'm I'm not here to debate or discuss. Just really share a, a feeling, and you know, you had that one guy who committed suicide over his fines, and just you know, whether it's the two years of COVID and what that did to all of us when people all around us were getting sick and dying or what, but something just made me a whole lot more sensitive to the need to hold hands and and help each other, and. Um, I, I really appreciate that some of the comments that have been made this evening, um, it, it makes at least me and some of my concerns on it feel, feel heard and I appreciate it. 
And um, I hope we can just keep working together um, to not feel like neighbor is pitted against neighbor and um, people are calling each other in and, you know, even Mrs. Chapels after all that stuff, uh, when one of our neighbors helped clean up her property, she still got a $150 fine and she was compliant. Um, I got a fine when I cut a tree down, didn't know it was legal, illegal a bunch of years ago when some lightning struck it and it was going to hit our house. We immediately complied. We got a fine. So that's all I mean. You know, there's exceptions. I think what we were talking about here, um, what Julio was talking about, I, I, I take him at his word, and I'm sure it's the case 95% of the time. And I guess what I'm talking about is the edge cases that end up getting us all angry with each other and pitting each other against each, each other. I don't like it. I love this town. I care about you guys. And I'm just glad it seems like we're going to kind of dig in and work on us. I think it'll make us a better town. I want us to be truly rural, which doesn't mean anything that I just mentioned. Go, go live like real rural. You know, I spent years in Ohio, even though I'm from New Orleans, and it's not like that. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the time and the opportunity and tonight's presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you, Anna. Can you hear me? I'm John Garotti, 162nd Avenue. I'm sure you guys all know who I am already. Can you guys hear me? All right. Code enforcement. Code enforcement. Code enforcement. What do we have to talk about code enforcement? That gentleman right there is the incredible, incredible employee of the town that most of the time can't even do his job properly. The reason being, most of the councilmen here, not most, some, let me correct that, use the code enforcement department as a, like a toy. And that's not what it's intended for. And to correct you, Bob, I was reading Senate Bill 60. You can't. And you might be listening to Mr. Polyakov, but you cannot be on a council position and make complaints anonymously, proactively, reactively. It's not legal. But that's what we have courts for. For a town to be rural, we had a workshop on this, rural. We hold the record in fines for residents, hundreds of thousands of dollars. What part of that is rural? I mean, irreparable? We live in the country. We live in the Everglades. It's, we, 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 we speak a whole bunch of let's do rural, let's do that. We put on cowboy hats, and it's all false. It's, it's not real. Code enforcement, yes. You don't want this to turn into some towns that have trailers everywhere, and people can't live their lives correctly. But I'll tell you what, sit in a code enforcement hearing, as many of us have, and you'll see how this is not how code enforcement is supposed to be at all and i am not afraid to say any of it hundreds of thousands of dollars on a fine on the property who does that where's the cap where's the limitation mr bright cruz brought up a really good point why not have an ombudsman why not have a filter why does it immediately have to be toss them to the courts let's destroy the resident because that's what happens on many occasions that gentleman right there has not been allowed to do his job i'm a victim right here i have no problem saying it it's facts. All you got to do, do a records request. You guys have access to all this. Look and see what this town has done to many residents for 20 years. And yes, I'm looking right at you in the face. Dead at you in the face. Because most not, of it's hey, your fault, my friend. Let's not get personal. It's, I it's, gonna, it's it personal, be, then we're going to... It has to be personal. You know why? Because it's not five bucks. It's hundreds and thousands of dollars into the millions. Our code enforcement process is wonderful until it gets into the, code, into the courts. Until it goes in front of the magistrate, sit in one of the meetings yourself. It's not personal. There. It's business. This is a business. That's all I have for tonight. Julio, great job. Thank you. Any other? Uh, good evening, uh, counselors, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen in the room. My name is Pamela also, and I am very happy to be in this meeting. Actually, uh, today is my first time, and I can tell you guys, I learned a lot about you, especially about the presentation of Mr. Julio Medina, who uh, is uh, the person who is in charge of the code enforcement. 
and he did a neat job, neat presentation, and I can even say, I don't regret that I came to this meeting because I am learning a lot about you guys. Um, as I told you before, my name is Pamela Olson. I am the owner broker of Pamela Olson Group Realty. And I am trying to work it out and start my niche in the Southwest ranches. And I figured it out and realized that coming to this meeting is the best way to learn about your city. I think this is from the inside that I have to learn. So when the time comes to present any listing, I will have all the inside from the city to start promoting my listings and houses. So I thank you a lot for receiving me open arms because I was able to stay even I am not from the city, um, but I was able to be here and learn for your beautiful uh, city. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to make a quick comment on that. I don't normally do this, but while you're here. So we did recently actually put together a um, kind of a, a fact sheet for realtors to get familiar with our town, to kind of let folks know um, what it's like to be here, some of the restrictions and some of the non-restrictions and things like that. It's available on our website. If you, I would encourage you to take a look at that. Yes, I already uh, check on your website. Actually, I haven't found yet part yet, but I will be in touch with the city so they might show me where is that part because I learn a lot in your website. It's well done about the parks and the activities that you usually have. And plus coming to this meeting, it will help me a lot. Great. But I will check it out immediately, probably tomorrow, by coming to the city hall and see where is that part. So Perfect. I compliance with that. Great. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you. Is that it? All right. Um, board reports. We have any board reports this evening? Seeing none, is there uh, our council member comments? I'll yeah, start. Okay. Go ahead, Go ahead, Gary. Go ahead, Gary. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be really quick. <laughs> uh, just a few general announcements. Uh, we, um, Coming up, we have the uh, 5K, which we've already talked about at the barn. Uh, we know that the Education Advisory Board is m moving flamingos around all the time in different spots. They appear everywhere, and it's 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 quite fun to see that as you're driving around. They're here every, one day and gone the next. Um, we have our, our next hazmat uh, at the barn on the 29th of April. And uh, it's going to have uh, shredding and uh, 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 prescription drop off with Davy Police. Um, this coming Saturday, we got big Saturday. We have Water Matters from 9 to 3. And then when you get done with that, uh, come to the barn dance if you've got your tickets. Uh, it's going to be uh, food provided by Outback. And there's, uh, I got a sneak peek at uh, earlier today. <laughs> it's uh, the, all the uh, stuff you can bid on and prizes, and it's uh, quite extensive. Nice. So yeah, it looks it's uh, nice. it's going to be it's going to be a great great night uh, for everybody who's got tickets for it. Um, the DMV Flowmobile is going to be here from uh, uh, here at Town Hall on the 22nd. Uh, if you need uh, uh, their services, contact Deborah at the town clerk office for an appointment. Um, uh, we just got handed a uh, notice notification that uh, Florida Department of Transportation, FDOT, is going to be uh, resurfacing uh, I-75 from Sheridan until uh, Griffin Road, and it's gonna start in uh, April, and expected to last for two years. And there's gonna be some lane shutdowns uh, going on with all of that. And um, one other thing I have, uh, when it, uh, is, is gonna be directed to Keith, and it's concerns uh, uh, a property that we've all heard about that uh, apparently had a, a very uh, ugly ending to a, a venue uh, that occurred that and it's been uh, yep. I, I just want to ask Keith you know several questions if you can bring us up to speed if uh, sure. legally if you can tell us anything so um, I believe you're talking about the incident that occurred on CLO farms correct okay 
Um, I was notified by the Briar County Property Appraiser earlier today, and they said it can be announced tonight, that on Tuesday they notified uh, the farm uh, that they uh, have revoked their agricultural tax exemption uh, effective immediately, that they believed it was uh, obtained uh, illegally, and uh, as such they have issued a full-out revocation. Awesome. Um, links directly to code enforcement and, and let me explain why here's a resident who's now been cited julio eight times maybe more at this point eight times so we're now getting up into the maybe more may, you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in code enforcement fines rather than bringing the property into compliance which they could they decided to hire legal counsel and to sue the town saying it's our fault that they should be allowed to do uh, what they're doing, okay? And this seems to be a common phenomenon in Southwest ranches. You know, when, when you speak, and I heard the residents speak about hundreds of thousands in code enforcement fines, each one of those could have been stopped way before the hearing just by bringing the property into compliance, and in this case, stop having illegal activities at your establishment. So now this resident is who has, you know, I think we, ha we have a special hearing, Julio, coming up for what, five more parties? Four or five more parties? Four more parties, so that's another $40,000 that we'll be seeking in fines. So 40000 in fines plus legal fees, that it will be hundreds of thousands of dollars that you're going to see that resident come before you, us and say, why do I have so much uh, code enforcement fines on my property? When they were told at the get-go how to bring the property into compliance, code enforcement does everything in their power to help that property owner understand how to bring the property into compliance. But this case, they chose not to bring it into compliance. So uh, as a result, uh, the, the town uh, will be responding to their complaint uh, with the newfound information that they were uh, revoked their ag exemption. Uh, and we will be providing it to the circuit court and telling the judge that uh, there is no even uh, law that they could pretend to be under that would uh, permit them to have that use or that activity uh, within that establishment. In addition to that, we've recently got noticed um, that they intend to have another major party, I think this weekend, Andy, next, next weekend, excuse me, next weekend. And our police officers, um, as a result of the revocation of ag and the life safety issues that have become present based upon um, uh, what occurred, you know, a few nights ago, uh, that they will issue an NTA, which is a notice to appear. Mayor, you and I have spoken how NTAs work. Uh, and they will be required to go to uh, criminal court uh, to explain why they continually violate the town's code. Um, if this problem persists, and if it will be up to the council how it chooses to uh, continue with it, um, you are absolutely able to seek an injunction to prevent further activities, similar to how you gave um, a street uh, that had a veterinary clinic uh, relief, um, you know, several months ago. Uh, it's the same process in which you would say to a court, this needs to stop immediately. That will be a decision of the council at some point in the future if this activity does not stop. So, um, council member, hopefully that answered your question. That's the latest update on this, uh, and you know we will keep you advised. Thank, thank you, Keith. Um, one other thing I, that I need to mention, I failed, and I just got messaged by my significant other. <laughs> um, the, the annual Rolling Oaks egg hunt is going to be in. Uh, the day before Easter, uh, April 8th, uh, it starts at 11 o'clock. Uh, you can have pictures with the bunny rabbit. We have a buddy wrangler, a buddy photographer, and a bunny. Nice. And we have prizes for uh, the golden egg prize. Uh, uh, the vice mayor is in charge of that one. Uh, <laughs> Jim's really good with that one. Uh, but we have uh, 5,000 eggs out there. They're going to be distributed. It's going to be a lot of fun. The weather is predicted to be great. <coughs> And so, uh, I don't know, you know, we're all like a month off on this, but uh, so that will be coming up and there'll be flyers uh, put out here at Town Hall and, and uh, other associations, you know, concerning that. So just want to mention that, that it gets me dinner, so. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you, Gary. David? 
Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, um, everybody's got these red lights on their microphones, except for me. This is supposed to be an experimental uh, microphone that they're using that we're going to be transitioning into. You know, I, I'll tell you, I don't think it works as nearly as well as these because you're not coming across All right. on the, you know, you really have to, I think you have to really speak directly into that. Right mic. into the mic. Yeah, I think right. so, unfortunately. <clears throat> All right, well, <laughs> thanks. Um, uh, I was going to start with some other issues, but I want to thank Keith and thank Code Enforcement for the, the issues that we just spoke about. Um, Nove since November 5th, 2020, my phone has rang um, three, two to three times a week about complaints about that property. And, um, you know, all we can do is do our process and to learn that the um, agricultural classification was revoked um, because basically the way it was put to me that, that in, once they looked inside the barn from that video that everybody has seen that it there really is no ag purpose on that property so um, I commend uh, Mr. Kier for his work on this I commend Mr. Polykoff Keith thank you so much for your work Mr. Medina, thank you so much for your work on this. It, it's very much appreciated by the neighbors that have contacted me constantly about this. Uh, moving on, um, the 5K, um, I know that it's a great issue. I've participated in many years. This year I won't make it. I'll be out of town. Uh, my mother's 81st birthday. I have to go to that. Can't miss that for anything. Um, the Rural Arts and Design Advisory Board uh, has kind of... Um, worked with Laura Warren in uh, doing a mural on the uh, Polyakov uh, Founders Wall. Now, if um, those of you that are unfamiliar with this, if you take a drive out west, just before you get to the CVS, you'll find the Founders Park. And just along the east side of that is a, is a wall that for many years has just been blank. Well, Ms. Warren, uh, proposed and the and was awarded with the project of putting a mural on there. Uh, she did six panels, and then um, everybody was so uh, I guess amazed with her amazing work, and her work is beautiful. That she uh, actually was contracted with doing the remainder of the wall. Actually, the wall. I guess there's 12 more panels that she's working on, and uh, that's proceeding. Also, with the Rural Arts and Design Advisory Board, um, get your cameras ready because they're working on the 11th Annual Photo Contest. So get your cameras ready to participate with that. Uh, I spoke with Chris Brownlow regarding the Parks Board. And recently, they're going to, uh, in the near future, they will be discussing um, the various trails within Sunshine Ranches. And um, this has to do with a recent development that's going to that's proposed to affect Sunshine Ranches. So, if you uh, are an equestrian and are interested in um, trails in Sunshine Ranches, it's kind of important to attend this meeting and express your interest in what's going on with that. Uh, my fourth item uh, has to do with traffic violations in the town. Let's go with District 1. Uh, I was provided with information from Davie Police Department, which has been doing an amazing, great job for uh, enforcing our traffic violations. The violations have increased substantially. And the purpose isn't to punish people. It's to keep the speeding down. And I'm going to give you a personal example. Two nights ago, I came home from work. And I decided, OK, I'm going to take my dogs for a walk. I try to do that as long as there's no meetings that I need to attend. And I'm walking from Holiday Trail west up Lou Ray Road and keeping my dogs on the side of the road. And I had a flashlight with me. It was, kind of, it was borderline twilight into dark. I started flashing my light at a car that was coming. The car was accelerating. And when it came to me, the car came within inches of me. I was not happy because the entire Luray Road was available. And this guy, and I later found out there was a delivery person from 
whatever, Amazon or whoever does deliveries in the neighborhood because he came in and left right away. He nearly ran me over, and if my dogs had been in the street, they would not be here with us today. And it very, very much frustrated me. Um, I couldn't make, I couldn't get a tag, couldn't do anything because it wasn't anything that I could supervise. I, I couldn't get any identification of the vehicle. It very much frustrated me. So, District 1, they've had 31 traffic violations. Of those 31 traffic violations, 23 were speeding. Every single one of those were outside of the inner roads, meaning uh, either on US 27 or Griffin. District 2, 65 traffic violations. Of those, 53 were speeding. 22 of those were on the inner roads of uh, District 2. District 3, 35 violations. Of those 35, 21 were speeding. Seven were on the inner roads. Not so much, not, 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 not a big deal issue either. District 4, 141 violations. That's probably more than everybody else combined. 127 were speeding. And 47 of those citations were on the inner roads that are not Griffin Road. So speeding still continues. And I just have to plead with Davey, please keep your work up, keep your work up. It is not time to sit by. I requested um, that the speed uh, sign that indicates the speed going sit in my driveway or sit on my property so people on Holiday can know what's going on because I know Ed Gonzalez talks to me frequently about the speeding, the speeding, the speeding. So it's something that really needs to, we're doing a good job, we just need to keep it on, keep going on with that. <clears throat> uh, Water Matters Day, folks seen this flyer. Uh, I already registered uh, Saturday morning. It opens at 9. And um, I, I happened to just uh, scan on one of the uh, news links. I don't know if it was uh, Local 10, probably is what it was. And I clicked on the link and it found out that I had to register. So if you're interested in getting uh, one, uh, get two free trees, first of all, I'll arrive early. But <laughs> second of all, <laughs> second of all, uh, register. So you have no, no inhibitions on you getting the trees. I know the town always has a set up there and it's always at a great location. I plan to be there for quite a while. Uh, so hope to see you there at Water Matters Day. And then last, this weekend we have the uh, spring forward of the time change. So don't forget about changing your, train, your, time, your clocks on Saturday night. And um, so you can be on time. Thank you, David. Yeah, Bob. All right. Thank you, Mayor. I was going to go through things that <laughs> I don't want to repeat. I mean, you guys have done a great job. But I do want to uh, get some clarification on some comments that were made earlier because I kind of feel like we were fed some misinformation here. Um, Keith, is it true that, you know, I cannot submit a code enforcement complaint on behalf of a neighbor because if I'm breaking the law, I get called all the time. I get emails all the time. I'm happy to relook at that. Um, I did ask when I was in Tallahassee this week, and uh, they told me that's exactly how a lot of uh, cities are handling it today. So, okay. you know, you are a citizen of the town. So being that, you are allowed to be a complainant on a code enforcement matter. Good, good. If you would clarify, because I'd hate to be in violation yes. of state law. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now as well, um, we also heard tonight that we have record code enforcement fines. Andy, I don't know if you have any visibility into the other cities since it's you're part of That 100% uh, is not correct. Sorry? That's 100% not a cor correct. Uh, Fort Lauderdale versus Southwest Ranch. Uh, Hollywood sure. is in the millions. Uh, I yeah. looked at one today there that was over $680,000. Yeah. So we're not even close. Uh, it didn't make sense to me either. I just want somebody to to say it. All right. Now, there, the saddest one that I heard was suicide by code violation or code enforcement violation. And, Andy, I do remember that one, but maybe you could further elaborate because it's a really sad story that I think is being exploited here. Well, yeah, thank you, Council Member. It was a, a horribly, horribly sad story. Uh, 
I'll be guarded in my comments, but but I, I will say that that resident had some, I, I think, some physical and mental illness that contributed to that problem. Uh, he was a hoarder over a number of years. The property was, was unkempt. He was unable to keep up with the property. And uh, while there was a, a, a town tax lien on that, the county, uh, their tax taxes hadn't been paid in, in years. The county tax bill, uh, I believe, far exceeded our, our lien for the property not being kept up. But the property was an eyesore. He unfortunately wasn't able to keep up with it. It limits our options in that case. It's not something that we go looking to do, but the neighbors surrounding that property shouldn't have to look at that and live with, with an eyesore. So we tried to address it. The property owner was not able to do it, was not able to keep up with it. And, and so the fines just continue, continue to accumulate, unfortunately. Council member, I also I have the definitive answer now because I just pulled up the bill and it's one paragraph, so it's Thank so you. easy to see. It says a person designated as a code inspector may not initiate an investigation of a potential violation of duly enacted code or ordinance by way of an anonymous complaint. A person who reports a potential violation must provide his or her uh, name and address to the governing body of the respective Board of County Commissioners before an investigation occurs. There's no prohibition. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you both. That's all I have there. Great. Thank you, Bob. All right. Um, oh, thanks. He's busy anyway. Vice Mayor, almost skipped you. Sorry about that. I, you were very quiet down there. I am. I, uh, my head's spinning. I'm sorry. Uh, Steve, I'm directing this at you. Before I get started, I had the opportunity to go to the barn and look at the auction items, too. And I will tell you, you and I will be fighting over a couple of items this year again, like we did the belt buckles All right. last year. So I'm looking forward to it, prepare buddy. Prepare yourself. All Bring right. your checkbook, whatever you got, you know, <laughs> hang on. All right? All looking right. forward to it. All right. Uh, I'd like to speak about the trailers real quick. Um, I want to thank Tom personally for his involvement. He's the one that moves the speed trailers around. I have a list here of where they've been, and I know the next three uh, locations as to where they're going to end up. Remember, they stay in place for about two weeks at a time. They've been through every north-south cut through through the town. Volunteer, Dykes, 172nd, 185th, 186th, Mathers, 166 in Malaluca. They've been placed there two weeks at a time, so those areas are covered. Uh, midpoint at 178th at the Park Swale, uh, the, 30, the 132 block of Luray, uh, out on 145th Avenue, which is uh, Thoroughbred. In the middle of Thoroughbred, it's been Roanoke's Barn, Hancock Road. So these are the places where this trailer has been, and I hope the residents have seen them out there. The three locations coming up are uh, one over close to Holiday Trail. Somebody requested that <laughs> in the 6400 block. And the others are uh, that I'll give Tom this evening uh, out on 198th, about a quarter of a mile in off of Griffin facing north. And the other one's out on 188th. Uh, around the 5500 block. That was one that was requested there. I'll be giving this to you in a little bit. So those are the areas. I think the traffic has slowed down. I've noticed a difference on 166. They're not running through there at 50 anymore. They've slowed it down to about 30, 35. So I can almost live with that. But these trailers are there for you to uh, request. Send me an email. Give me a phone call. I'll get the information to Tom, and we'll get these things moved around. Tom, thank you, buddy, for taking care of us. I really appreciate it. Uh, next, the, we have three council members going to Tallahassee in a week and a half. We're going up there to speak about the issues of town, fireworks ordinance being one of the biggest issues up there. Uh, Councilman Jablonski, Kaczynski, and I are going to head up that way and see what we can do. I don't know how much influence you actually have on them, but at least we're talking to them, tell them about our town issues, and we just have to wait and see what happens when this legislation's over. You saw that the Broward County Sheriff's, and I'm really happy about this, is starting to crack down on the illegal drifting in the streets and the racing. I saw that on the news today. There was an incident up off of Andrews. 
the police heard that it was going to take place. Apparently, they advertised it all over that it's going to take place. And the police kind of surrounded the area waiting for them to show up. And when they did, they converged on them. They, I believe, arrested three or four people. They impounded three or four cars. And they confiscated a few weapons, one being an AK-47. Now, for the love of me, I have no idea why somebody would be carrying an AK-47 in their car. And lastly, that brings me to the bill that's in Tallahassee now. And I spoke about it last month. And this bill bothers me a lot, that any person in the state of Florida can carry a weapon without a permit. I mean, I want you to think about that for just one second. No training, no, no knowledge of how to handle a firearm, no any kind of, of uh, checks and balances if you're mentally ill, nothing. You just go out and buy a gun. And that scares me because if it gets into the hands, and it will, not of the criminals, but of the honest people who have no knowledge, they take that home and a kid ends up with it. You heard recently that the six-year-old went to school and shot their teacher. How did that kid get hold of that gun? I mean, it's a terrifying thing for an officer to walk up to a car not knowing if that resident or that person has a gun. I know that they appreciate if you're registered and they f call it in and you get in a traffic citation, they know that you have a concealed weapon. I imagine they appreciate that a lot more than not knowing that you have one. So that's one of the things that uh, has really uh, bothered me. And I don't see the rationality of it going through, but I've got this feeling that it will. So, you know, all we can do is cross our fingers and hope that, uh, hope that this bill doesn't go through, along with several others up there that I've heard over the past week that just, for people to be smart as they are claiming to be, these bills doesn't show it. It's a shame some of the things that are coming out of Tallahassee this year. All right? Mayor, that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, David? If I can address one of the... Sure. Member Albritton did say regarding that, that legislation that you just passed, if it does indeed pass. You've got to speak right into the microphone oh, or no, we can hear uh, you. Once again, I'm going to uh, go back to my comments. Uh, regarding the issue that you had just spoken about, um, regarding the firearms issue, um, just as he was saying, it just occurred to me, uh, we have no protections here uh, in, in, in town hall or in, in council chambers. And I was wondering if it would be within the um, any guidelines or any requirements or whatever for uh, the town administrator to purchase a metal detector at the entrance of uh, these chambers. I mean, I don't want to do it, but I know that we've had issues with uh, code enforcement hearings where um, there have been neighbors that have been very, very agitated. And to if they're now allowed, people are now allowed to conceal carry without a permit. And, you know, sometimes these get very angry people. Um, maybe this should be something we shouldn't think about. David, real quick, I, I, I'm probably 110 percent positive that we always have law enforcement here at these meetings. That's true. Okay, and that, and I happen to know who they are, and I guarantee if someone comes in, you don't have to worry about them engaging. I promise you that. You know, and uh, uh, you know, we hope that never happens, but. I'm not worried about somebody coming here. I'm worried about the uh, accidental deaths that's going to take place with the firearms from people not knowing or not understanding what the firearms are all about. I mean, that's a scary thought for me. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm a gun owner myself. So. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, just uh, most of the ground's been covered, which is awesome. I did want to, we had an issue that uh, came up, uh, I don't know, a meeting or two ago. Um, related to the dangerous dogs and the uh, kind of the origin of that, why we decided to do our own ordinance. And, um, and so I knew there was reasons behind it, but frankly, I had not dug into the specifics of it. So since the last meeting, I went ahead and had a conversation with Keith and we talked a little bit about it. And so I wanted to bring that forth so that um, it was, you know, there was, people could hear why we did what we did. 
Um, if we if we if we don't have the ordinance ourselves, there are, as was stated uh, before, there are um, regulations in state law and even county law that could be applied. Uh, we would probably use the state law to do it. But there's a number of issues with that. Um, issue number one is that if unless the officer sees it happen, and Keith, please, if I, if I misstate something, please jump in there and correct me. If the officer doesn't see it happen, then um, we can't bring it forth, which is an issue because very rarely is the officer going to be there when it occurs. It could happen, but uh, it, it probably probably won't. Um, if, it, if it was brought forth, then we are at the mercy of the state's attorney as to whether it's going to be prosecuted or not. Um, frankly, they are designed to work with much larger issues, more encompassing issues than a, a dog bite. And so it's very likely that they will um, choose not to prosecute it. Um, I believe we could still go forward, but then we could, we would basically be paying for both um, probably the prosecution and the defense of it. And so um, it, 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 it's, it's, not, uh, it's not really a viable situation. So all of those to say that whereas if we create our own ordinance, then it flows into our normal process where it comes before our magistrate and, and we can handle it um, as any other code violation. Much less expensive, um, much more viable to do a prosecution, and uh, the whole issue gets resolved uh, much quicker. Keith, what did I leave out? Is that right? Yeah, Gary? Yeah, we, you all got a copy, I think, of the police okay. report. Yeah, the yes, mayor, the, yes. In Rolling, o in Rolling Oaks uh, a day ago, we had um, two loose identified as pit bulls uh, attack a, a, a mutt. Right. A 10-year-old mutt and mauled it. But somebody's pet, right? I mean, yeah. it was, yeah, yeah somebody's yeah, went pet. On their it wasn't property. Like a wandering dog, yeah. Yeah, and, and killed the dog. Right. So, un ultimately, unfortunately. Right. And they haven't been able to catch the pit. They haven't, they haven't found the pit bulls, but they've been identified by somebody knows who they are. Sure. And under our ordinance, as I understand it, that we're drafting, would they would still be liable for that. Right. So that's something to, something to consider. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, so there's uh, there, there's um, there's a lot of good reasons why this makes sense to have our own ordinance. Um, I apologize, I didn't know them all right up front when the question was asked. But uh, as I said before, um, I would find out and bring that back. So I wanted to make sure I brought that back. Um, all right, a couple other things. Uh, just uh, Newell, I appreciate what you said, um, and if we can get that uh, resolution here before the council, I'd appreciate it. Um, and uh, and then I just wanted to make a, I think I was going to make some comments about Seattle Farms, but I think, I'll, I think we've, we've gone there. Um, what I did want to do is make a comment uh, more generally about code. Um, there's a tendency, and it's not just our code, it's all code. Frankly, it's all over the justice system that, um, that something terrible will happen and, and, or something bad will be continuing going on if we're talking about code. And what seems to happen is the folks that were originally incurring the issue, that were originally being offended by it, that were really originally harmed by it, seem to be forgotten. And all of a sudden, the perpetrator becomes the victim. And um, I've never bought into that. I think that the original victim should not be forgotten. And, um, and I think this kind of falls into one of those cases. We didn't, the, any, any of these ordinances that are on the books, none of them were put in there to be punitive. None of them were put on there to hurt residents. All of them were put on there to protect residents. That's why they're there. And as has been stated many times, if there's an issue and someone is attempting to resolve that issue in a timely manner, the, the fines will be minimal, if anything. In most cases, there won't be one. Um, it's those situations where, um, as we've talked about, whether it's overgrown property, 
um, that destroys the look of a neighborhood, whether it's fill that's being brought in that's destroying the, the, the you know, the flooding of, of their neighbors, all those other things, you know, all those neighbors that are being harmed by this, um, they should not be forgotten. Um, they are the reason why these ordinances are in place to protect them. And so the goal here, as was stated many times, is to get into compliance as quickly as we can, to keep the, the fines down, and frankly, to resolve the situation so that the neighbors around it that are having to deal with it don't have to deal with it anymore. And, and I just don't want that to be lost in this discussion because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. And um, I would love it, I would honestly and sincerely love it if we went through a whole year and we didn't collect one penny in fines because everything was resolved immediately and without a fine. That would be, that would be uh, nirvana, that would be the awesome um, situation. And so that's the goal and, um, and, you know, and code is our best, best tool to get us there. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, I just want to uh, add something to that. that uh, I've been to numerous code hearings now since I have suddenly time on my hands <laughs> <laughs> to do that. And, uh, and I've been advising a lot of neighbors who have run into code situations, what to do and all that. But one thing I've noticed, it's, it's um, uh, virtually across the board, 100%, is somebody who is in violation or about to be in violation or what have you, when, when they ask for more time, it's always granted yeah there's no there's no you know set time yeah and it's only when it becomes when it becomes to the point of being ridiculous yeah do, do, does it, is there a stop time right. but when somebody needs more time to come into compliance it's always granted right and i have to i have to admire that between the code official the legal and and the special magistrate they all grant more time i've yeah. noticed that across the board you know great point for, to come into compliance Great point. Mm -hmm. So, just something I wanted yeah. to point out. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think I'm good. All right. Very good. Keith, do you have any comments sure. this evening? Uh, uh, Mayor, I was in Tallahassee the last uh, day, um, and I uh, had the opportunity of meeting with our uh, Lieutenant Governor, Jeanette Nunez, met with the Speaker of the House, I met with the Senate President, I met with the incoming uh, Speaker of the House as well. I said hi to all of our officials, Robin Bartleman, uh, Cassell, who's a new uh, representative on, on our border, uh, and uh, Woodson. And, I, uh, I, you know, I will tell you that the town's in good shape on appropriations and things of that nature. We're not in good shape on the fireworks bill. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been told by many people uh, that we're going to have to tweak it, and it's something that I will look at in the next week. And get back to you all on. Um, there is a major fear that they realize that they've opened up Pandora's box essentially by their allowing, carte blanche allowing of fireworks. And they're afraid that, uh, that Wellington snuck its bill in and that if they grant ours, that there's gonna be so many more communities on our heels that's gonna try to do the exact same thing. Well, maybe they so, need to fix it then, right? Um, <laughs> you would think. So, um, yeah, I just want to give you guys a heads up, especially whoever's going up there, that it is, a, you, as it's currently written, I don't see it passing as it's currently written, and we're going to have to make some modifications to see if we can Do you think that's tighter. possible to make the modifications? I mean, are you... you so I, I was asked to, to find out uh, a, additional ways um, of essentially allowing it, and, and I think what they want to see in it is actually a permit process so that, uh, which is essentially what I think Jeff Kadem suggested to mm -hmm. the town plan board. Yes. And, and so when that came up, they said, well, incorporate what you were thinking in your own ordinance and, and transfer that into state law so that we can see that people who want to do the fireworks actually can have a process in which they can attain them. And, and, and that we may be much more open to because then you're not saying straight out denial, which is what they're worried about. Um, and instead you're saying they can be allowed in these situations. Mm -hmm. So um, I promise, and I met with Nelson Diaz following half the meetings, uh, that I would work with you all and him to uh, see if we can do an amendment to the bill. Uh, and I promise I'll be working on that next week uh, to email you all. Uh, 
uh, Keith, is there any uh, any problem with, uh, with us working on the 362 days of the year uh, ordinance? Uh, I will talk. To, uh, we're looking into that right now, but okay. continue. The compliment board needs to continue what they're doing because at some point we're going to find a, a compromise. So, you know, yes, they need to continue doing what they're doing. There's an argument whether or not we could be preempted on that. I'm going to argue otherwise. Um, but we're working on that issue right now to to see what the overall thought process is. Keith, the, um, just a quick comment on this. Since uh, the vice mayor and two council members are going up next Monday, maybe you can keep feeding them so everybody's on the same page, emails. And absolutely. Whatnot. That's why I wanted just to announce it publicly tonight because okay. yeah, I just and, found out. And, and I, you know, that was always my intention, and I think that was, that was as far as I know, the council's intention is not to just outlaw it. And it was from the very beginning. It was to, we recognize that there's, you know, those are special days and special holidays and patriotic days, and, and that, I don't think that was ever the intention. I think the intention was to give us the latitude to set up some guardrails to where whether it was certain locations that were, you know, further away from animals, um, or, you know, where everybody could come out. And I frankly think that would be an awesome idea to get, you know, a bunch of folks out there, a little competition going on, uh, you know, but away from the animals. And um, so some, the ability to put some guardrails around it as opposed to outlawing it completely or having it, as it is now, totally, you know. So, so based upon what you said, I have a, a, a general question. If we, if we have time tonight, so I guess sure. it's a good night yeah, to do, do it. Um, is to, A, what is the consensus if the town were to designate a town park for such activity to occur? Is that something that you all would be comfortable with? I'd be in support of that. Yeah, I, I would. I, I mean, to me, um, you know, the, the preserve area is, is, is not a bad place for it. I don't it's know like if that... Founders Park. Yeah, that, absolutely. Okay, but yes, yeah, I think that's okay. And and then yeah, right. we'd have to. That's what I say. I, I don't. I should probably shouldn't set it off the top top of my head because it takes some more research to find the right spot. But yeah, I I, I think that would be along the lines that makes sense. Broadway. Um, They're perfect. <laughs> so and then the the second uh, question would be, as long as it's sort of you know unanimous on the council to potentially use a permitting process, you know we would put that in as well. And, and that may give them the comfort level that the chair, I know the mayor actually met with the chair. Yeah. Um, I learned that, you know, you had a good conversation. But yeah, we it, did, you did. And I brought that up with, with her yes. to let her know that we're, you know, we're looking for that middle of the road option. So um, I will propose it and you all will be able to follow up with feedback next week from being up there. The number one thing uh, publicly to let everyone know that everyone is talking about in Tallahassee now, when you walk into anyone's office, is the affordable housing bill. Um, this bill will have, n won't have an impact on Southwest ranches, but it will have tremendous impact on the rest of the state of Florida. And, and just so you all understand, I, I just want to spend one minute to explain why. The bill essentially says that if you have a commercial or industrial property, as long as 40% is utilized for workforce housing, attainable housing, which is 120% AMI, it's not a huge number, it's almost market rate in, in a lot of the state. Um, then you can have maximum density, whatever density you want, and with the maximum height that the municipality has within a mile radius of that site. So the benefit to Southwest Ranches is our maximum height is 35 uh, feet. So as long as the municipality maintains its code, uh, this law will have virtually no impact in the town because a, a place like Coquina, uh, you know, or, or whatever our commercial is, would never be able to build to the density that would make it profitable at a 35 foot height limit. So where are developers salivating tonight? It passed the Senate as I was leaving. On, on they, they rolled it quickly. They went uh, second reading, third reading, back to back. It went like the quickest yeah. bill I've ever seen. Unanimous, by the way. Not, not even, you know, both parties voted unanimously in favor of this bill, and it's heading to the House right now, is every hotel property that you see on the beach will be converted to mass density residential because they're commercially zoned, and they will be able to go up to the maximum height within a mile radius of that location. So some of them, you know, a mile on, on Fort Lauderdale Beach is Las Olas. Right. You know, so... Uh, you can go to the maximum height within a mile 
unlimited density as long as 40% is workforce. Now, of that workforce housing, it's only requiring a 30-year deed restriction. So they're only doing it on one generational cycle. So uh, this bill flew through the House and Senate. Um, there are cities going bonkers up there. Uh, Surfside was up there. Uh, um, Bay Harbor Island, like all these waterfront communities were going absolutely crazy because what they did in their zoning code, it's interesting, if you go to Sunny Isles, they transferred all of their commercial to the west side of A1A and their uh, residential to the east side of A1A so that they'd have all the oceanfront properties and then the commercial on the west. This bill now allows all that commercial property to be built as of right to what it looks at on, on the east side. And, and, and more importantly than that, it's, it's truly an amazing bill. Uh, what, what's even more interesting is they don't have to account for infrastructure, the municipality, or anything else. And it is not allowed to be approved by a city commission or a city board. It's administratively approved by zoning staff. It's not allowed to be shown to anyone but zoning staff. This is a, it was, it started out in 93 page bill. It ended up being a hundred and something pages. Um, most people haven't read the entire bill. Uh, but it is, uh, it's got some really unique uh, issues in it, and uh, you're going to see massive development as a result of this. But I'm not really worried about the town because as long as the council keeps that height low, you're not going to have the impact from that bill. So there's no impact to, there, there's no mitigation for things like traffic. So Fort Lauderdale Beach will be unapproachable, and they're going to have to put in subways to get people in there or some reasonable truth. I'm thinking Miami Beach. Where, where Surfside was going crazy is is uh, the mayor, Shlomo, I forgot his last name, was, was up there room after room that I was jumping to, was saying that they don't have the water and sewer right. that can handle that additional density. So the burden it, will be on the municipalities to build up. And that that's what the, the legislators were saying. That's not our problem. That's your problem. You need to plan for the future. So, and, and the reason why it's interesting for Has the Has anybody town, ever heard of home rule yeah. up there? And, and no. I, I mean, is that no. even... I was going to say that this, this, voted is, it out. this is the first time in Florida history that the Florida legislature has uh, superseded zoning and land use codes of municipalities. They've totally taken it within their own discretion wow. to dictate what can be built. So, literally, my phone has rung 10 times since I was sitting here from mayors from other cities asking you know what how this is going to impact them uh because on the oceanfront cities it's going to be a i don't think you'll find another hotel you know because the hotels are going to convert to residential why wouldn't they they're going to make you know four, 10 times more money you know becoming a, a residential property just like what happened down on the south beach in the 90s all those old hotels converted to basically condos yes so, you know, it's important for you all to hear it now because it's going to pass in the next day or so in the House. Um, it will take effect on July 1st. The governor's already stated that. Uh, so he's going to sign it instantaneously. So that's it, Mayor. <laughs> Just wanted you to know more importantly that I don't see the impact on the town, but I see tremendous impact on the rest of the state. Oh, yeah. Wow. All right. Thank you, Keith. Bob, do you want to speak about the... Uh, uh, meeting that you and I went to with uh, uh, at Pembroke Pines, uh, the town hall meeting that we attended. You want to go for it? Go ahead. I'm sure you have better notes than I have. Well, I, I just wanted to mention that the issues that were brought up by the residents to the what meeting is this? Why don't you just uh, the introduce the town hall? The uh, Pembroke Pines had a town hall meeting. Okay. With, was it five of the state representatives? Yeah, it was that the were there. Yeah, I, I know the meeting. I just right. wanted the right. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, right. And uh, the residents brought up issue after issue that was going to affect them. Fortunately, a lot of them don't affect Southwest Ranches because we don't have the density and the population that right. they have. But some of the issues that came up were just unbelievable. Some of the condo associations, they have to be 100% funded. Uh, and that means that the people are going to have to pay a lot of money up front uh, for any infrastructure to be done. And, and they can't afford it. So they're actually going to be pushed, literally pushed out of their own homes because they can't afford what's coming in the future. But these are issues like this, one after the other after the other. There must have been 20 people that asked questions, everyone different, about something that was coming up that 
was going to adversely affect hundreds of thousands of people. It was crazy. It was just crazy. Yep. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I heard about that. One other quick comment? Okay. <laughs> we are so off our agenda yeah. tonight. This well, is what happens when we one. get a short uh, agenda. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Russell and I attended a meeting that was hosted by Debbie Wasserman, Repres Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz over at uh, uh, Novi, Nova Southeast, and it was about appropriations. And there may be opportunities for us to fund our EOC. This isn't something that happens quickly. If, it's, if we're ap approved for the appropriation, it, it takes a year or two to get into law, which right. is right on our timeline. Yeah, it is. But uh, at the end of the day, her comment to everybody was, there are a number of appropriations still available. They used to call them earmarks. Mm -hmm. um, but it's getting to be more and more of a challenge because the group in power right now is pulled it out from five different areas that they used to be able to get appropriations in the past. We have to compete for them. This is a perfect job for Emily. Uh, she only gets 15 a year. So uh, if, if there's anything we can do to give our costs and if we don't get it this year we can we can right. keep trying until you know it, we get it but uh there's an opportunity there and another potential funding source if we don't get it from the state good great yeah thanks you know i mean this is a good example that uh you know the council is active in a lot of different ways uh talking to a lot of different different folks so all right andy i think it's finally your turn try not to take too much time okay because uh <laughs> no, i'm just teasing running a test Andy there, it is. there we go yeah I do have a few things but thank you council member because that's the perfect segue I lead off with some very good news as, as you all know uh, Congresswoman De Debbie Wasserman Schultz had been working on some funding for us for the Southwest Meadows drainage project and we got official word this week that we have been approved for six hundred thousand dollars in funding and so we're expecting the the agreement from from the federal government this spring and we'll get that back in front of you or before you so that we can say thank you for that money. So, and we will continue to work on other options like that. Uh, want to touch on the, the speed sign that we, uh, you had, had graciously uh, encouraged staff to go ahead with. That is currently on order. I don't know what the delivery date was. I think uh, Council Member Jablonski had asked me that. I need to check on that, but that, that is on order. We do have one coming in. We do look forward to getting that permanent sign up to see how that goes and that'll work uh, along with the speed trailers. I do have a request for you. Uh, I'm looking for consensus to, to spend some money that wasn't budgeted this year, and so I want to tell you what that's about. On the town-owned 25 acres, as you, as you all know, one of the, the hurdles that we've run into is, is potential wetlands mitigation. And we have reason to believe that the mitigation on that site may have been done back at the time that that West Broward Commercial Park was developed back in the late 80s. And so one of the, one of the firms that we have under, under uh, continuing services contract, Keith and Associates, has the ability to go back into those old files and track that down. And uh, we have a not to exceed from them for uh, $7,925, which uh, if, if we're able to be successful with this and, and obtain proof that that mitigation was done once upon a time, that'll be some of the best money we've ever invested. So we didn't budget for that this year, but I do want to get council cons consensus that, uh, that it's in our best interest to spend that money and get that project done. What was the answer? 7925, 7925. Yeah. And that's a not to exceed. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's. Yeah. I think I'm okay with that. Anybody have any issues with that? No, I have none. I no, have go question. for it. Yeah. Uh, the 7,900. But if this is from the 80s, it carries forward to now. If the mitigation was done on that site, that's it. It's done. Okay. So we have reasonably when 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 Bergeron developed that West Broward Park at the time. Right. That that when all the platting, when the zoning, the land use, et cetera, was all done, we believe that, that the wetlands mitigation might have been done at that time, which would make sense not to go parcel by parcel, lot by lot. Right. So when that park was done in total, we have reason to believe that uh, that, uh, that mitigation might have been done at that time, and we just need to uncover that. So that's what I'm asking for. That's why I was asking for council consens uh, consensus to, to allow us to do that digging. You got it. Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. I have a silly question. Has anybody bothered to ask Mr. Bertrand <laughs> if he did? You know, have you, have us we a clue? contacted Ron? It, it, all part of the process, yes, and, and yes, that's part of what we'll do as well. But but if it's been done, I mean, he could tell us, yeah, I did it, but we still got to go back and find no, that documentation to support it. Yeah. Exactly. yeah but it, it, we, we could at least find out if we were after a dry hole or something. Yeah. It, we, we do not believe so. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I had, but I know Russell wanted to provide an, an update on the LPR project. So if it's okay, Mayor, I'd like to throw it to Russell. Sure. Just a quick update. Uh, we plan to have uh, 15 locations where we're going to have the LPRs and I'm uh, happy to say that we have 13 locations that are up and running. Uh, we have two locations, one being the uh, 127th Avenue and Griffin Road where we needed the uh, ILA with Broward County to be completed. Uh, that's still pending. We're working through that with Broward County. Uh, and the last location is uh, Sheridan and 148th. That uh, equipment has been uh, installed. We're waiting on some inspections, and we should have that location up and running uh, by the end of the week, next week. So at that point, we'll have 14 of the 15 locations completed, and the only one that will be pending will be the one on Griffin and 127. There is a slight complication with that location, and I'll be bringing forward, uh, first I wanted to bring it forward to your attention, uh, that we will need to do a change order for that location. On the north side of Griffin Road, there is no electrical conduit running on alongside uh, the north side of Griffin Road. So the thought would be to put a solar-powered LPR system there. Um, but that's still going to require a set, that's a separate pole, separate camera system than the one that will be on the south side. So that will require an additional cost. So I wanted to bring that to Council's attention first, seek your permission to bring forward a change order, you'll have the opportunity to see all of the paperwork, the costs, and everything else like that. The estimate is somewhere between twelve dollars to $15,000 for that additional pole and camera system that will be solar powered that will run on the north side to catch the cars going uh, eastbound, I'm sorry, westbound on Griffin Road. So, so are you looking for um, a consensus tonight, or are you going to bring it back for? I'd like some consensus before I bring the actual change order back. It won't. We won't okay. do anything, but I, I don't want to process a change order or you know right. go through that that um, yeah. that exercise unless council supports doing yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, you're good. Any any concerns? So, uh, this is this is volunteer, correct? No, no, no. The location in question is the one on uh, Griffin and one, approximately 127th Avenue, where we'll need oh, okay. to have a change order because we're going to be installing a solar powered pole. Okay. No problem at all. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have consensus. Yeah, good. All right. And, um, and Mayor, I just have one thing that I totally forgot to tell you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there was a, a law change that requires the municipality to report the projected uh, lease revenue from our cellular tower. Um, it's crazy, but the law changed. Uh, Emil is doing what he needs to do to uh, update the financial records. Normally, we have a report that I think comes in when the 23rd, 23rd. It's going to be delayed slightly now because we have to project that revenue. He and I met on it, and the town is fully complying. There's no issue with filing deadlines or anything, but I just wanted to mention to you that because of a legal change, he has to update the financial projection. If I screwed that up at all, please let them know. <laughs> <clears throat> you nailed it. Okay. <laughs> is the lease revenue on that variable? I mean, it's uh, long before my time on the council. I don't recall anything it, it, to do with it's, it. It's X amount uh, a year, I think, uh, for the cell tower itself. I, I actually know. I don't think because I've read it recently. And then every co-locator on it pays uh, a flat rate per month. Um, so as long as those co-locators stay on that tower, the lease revenue is constant. Um, but and then at some point in the near future, we actually own that tower, which also changes the, the revenue because then it's all our revenue. So there's a lot of hurdles he's going through to do the necessary calculation. Thank you. All right. Okay. Let's move on to the approval of minutes, item number 10. We have, all right, I guess we'll just, uh, January, the meeting uh, regular minutes are of January 26th and February 9th. Um, is there any, um, motion well, do I have a motion to a second on that? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. 
Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any additions, corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, if we can please call the roll. Is there, from the public, is there any additions, corrections? Seeing none, if we can please call the roll. Councilmember Hartman? Yes. Councilmember Jablonski? Yes. Councilmember Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Albritton? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. Motion passes. Motion to adjourn. Thank you all. Thanks for coming out.